Throughout history, many military organizations became legendary for their prowess in battle, such as the Spartans, Roman legions, the Persian immortals, and modern-day warriors such as the Special Air Service, U.S. Navy SEALs, U.S. Marines, and U.S. Army Rangers and Special Forces. But none of these elite groups became both politically and financially powerful, surpassing the wealth of entire kingdoms, as well as having total autonomy over their actions, except for one. Who were the Knights Templar? How and when were they created? What did they do to leave such a heavy footprint upon history? What happened to them? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, a veteran of the United States Army and Marine Corps, former history professor, book author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Jerusalem, or the Temple of Solomon, also known as Knights Templar, or simply Templars, began their history as a protection force, escorting European pilgrims to the Holy Land after the First Crusade, but their responsibilities and influence would grow. After the Christian forces were mobilized by Pope Urban II in 1095, they finally wrestled Jerusalem from Muslim control in 1099. As a result, groups of pilgrims from every country and province in Western Europe started visiting the Holy Land. Many of these people were attacked, robbed, and killed as they crossed through contested regions of both Christian and Muslim-controlled territories during their pilgrimage. They needed security. Finally, in 1118, a French knight named Hugh de Payne created a military order, along with eight relatives and acquaintances, calling it the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, and it was acknowledged the following year. De Payne then created a Brotherhood of Fighters, in actuality warrior monks who took monastic vows, which included vows of chastity, devout study, poverty, and lived in a cloistered environment where they established a strict code of conduct. In 1120, King Baldwin of Jerusalem, or Baldwin II, handed over his palace to De Payne, which was the former Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. The Templars established this as their headquarters, establishing their lineage, and they became a commanding presence in the region. The order received papal recognition and a charter in 1129 by Abbot Bernard of Clairvaux, who endorsed the Templars and wrote the treatise titled In Praise of the New Knighthood, a text glorifying the establishment and mission of the Knights Templar, which also increased their popularity. As a result, they were officially recognized as a religious order by Pope Honorius II at the Council of Troyes in January 1129, becoming the first such military order to be created. The Templars were initially considered to be a branch of the Cistercians. The order would be led by an appointed Grand Master who resided in the headquarters at Jerusalem and then later at Acre from 1191 and then in Cyprus after 1291. Grand Masters were assisted by other high-ranking officials, such as the Grand Commander and Marshal, along with lesser officials in charge of specific branches of the orders to include property management and finances. The Templar Order grew as men from many backgrounds, peasants and nobles alike, who were religiously devout, yet also with a sense of adventure, clamored to join. But the selection process was brutal, even by medieval standards. The rules for joining were straightforward. Recruits had to be free men of legitimate birth, and if they wished to become a knight, they had to be of knightly descent starting in the 13th century. Although it was very rare, a married man could join the order provided his spouse agreed and if he was acceptable background. The recruits were often expected to make a significant donation to the order, sort of an entrance fee such as money or signing over titles of land. One thing remained a constant, no man could join who owed debts. For Templars, worldly pleasures were not permitted, such as observing celibacy, not having sex, as well as the usual nightly pastimes, such as hunting, falconry, wearing colorful clothing, including decorative belts. The Templars were only a simple wool cord belt to symbolize their chastity. The austere code of conduct also included not kissing women, not even their mothers or other relatives, 
They were not allowed to drink alcohol in general, although for certain sacraments and observed holidays, it was allowed. The local masters could make exceptions. They were forbidden from gambling or swearing. Prayer was required several times a day, and it was essential to their daily life, with particular veneration for the Virgin Mary. Every rule that a Templar lived by was outlined in the Rule of the Templars, was accepted by each member as he swore his oath and signed his pledge. While knights wore their white cloaks, sergeants wore a brown or black mantle or cloak, but Templars grew beards and had short hair. If any of these regulations were violated, then members were punished, whether from a withdrawal of privileges to flogging, banishment, and, in some cases, even life imprisonment. Expulsion from the order could be imposed for a knight losing his sword or losing his horse through carelessness or turning in the face of the enemy. Basically, a recruit's financial status was certainly a consideration, and when minors did join the order at the behest of their parents, they usually came with a dowry to pay their way in. In many cases, due to the widespread practice of primogeniture, only the eldest son would inherit a title or land. His siblings would have to find their own path. Many would do so in the clergy, boys to monasteries, girls to nunneries. As the Templars were primarily renowned as a fighting order, they had several different non-combat departments, such as land supervisors, bankers, armorers, animal managers, shipbuilders, tailors, Many jobs where young men with skills and ambition could excel. Other members of the order included priests, craftsmen, laborers, servants, and even some women who were members of affiliated nunneries. There were two ranks within the order, knights and sergeants, with the latter group including non-military personnel and laymen. Most recruits would join the second group, and during their history, the number of knights across the order were surprisingly few, with only a few hundred full brother knights at any one time sometimes rising to 500 knights in times of intense warfare. Most new recruits were in their mid-twenties, although sometimes recruits joined who were much older. These were rare exceptions, most being nobles, but one prime example was the legendary English knight Sir William Marshall, who joined the order just before his death in 1219. He left them money and land in his will and was buried with honors in Temple Church, London, where his effigy may still be seen today. In 1139, Pope Innocent II issued a papal bull allowing the Knights Templar special rights, such as exemption from paying taxes, being permitted to build their own castles and oratories, and they were only answerable to the Pope in power. In 1145, the Templars were granted permission to wear the white-hooded mantle of the Cistercian monks, and they made their own, as well as making their own armor and weapons. Their first major battle was during the Second Crusade, which lasted from 1147 to 1149, when in 1147 the Templars charged against the Muslims during the Battle of Montgisard, where 500 Templar knights helped several thousand coalition Christian infantry defeat a Muslim army of more than 26,000 soldiers. For the next 200 years, the Templars expanded from religious escort and protection service duties to becoming a garrison force in Europe and the Middle East. During the series of wars known as the Crusades, they became legendary fighters, earning the respect of both their fellow Christian warriors and their Muslim enemies alike. The Templars initially lived off donations from all social classes, usually being money, land, horses, military equipment, raw iron, precious metals, gems, and foodstuffs. To understand the medieval mindset, it was believed by many that such generosity to the clergy or the Templars would help ensure entry into heaven in their afterlife. As the Templars grew wealthier, they also invested their own money, buying into businesses and revenue-producing endeavors. Purchasing properties to generate revenue included farms, vineyards, mills, churches, townships, stone quarries, and even ships or anything else they thought would be a good investment. They also acquired wealth through conquest, and their war making was authorized by the church as long as it was in the proper service to the faith. Attacking heretics, Muslims, or other perceived enemies of the church was allowed. Towns, cities, castles, lands, all became part of the Templars' financial empire. However, the Templars had expenses, as armor, horses, feet, and weapons were expensive to make and maintain. And despite their many contributions, they still had tithing to the church. And although they did not pay taxes to the church on their businesses, there were still local taxes and operating costs in various provinces. Developing their reputation as fierce fighters during the Crusades, they often spearheaded attacks when alongside other Christian forces as they were driven by religious fervor 
and forbidden from retreating in battle unless significantly outnumbered or ordered to conduct a tactical withdrawal. The Templars were used as shock troops, leading attacks when not handling flank security duties, and many European commanders, such as Richard I of England, often found them difficult to control, but very effective during the Third Crusade, such as the Siege of Acre in 1189-91 against the forces of Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria. The Templar Grand Master Gerard de Ridefort, who was Marshal of the Kingdom under King Baldwin V, who died soon after in 1186, King Henry II of England, as part of his penance for the murder of Thomas Becket, sent a small fortune to the Templars in Jerusalem. Gerard de Ridefort joined the forces of Reynold de Chatillon and Guy de Lusagnon, leading a Frankish army. Ridefort led the Templars during the Battle of Crescent in 1187, as the 300 knights were engaged by Al Afdal, who had over 5,000 men. The Hospitaller Grand Master, Roger de Moulin, was killed and Ridefort was wounded but escaped. Due to their reputation, the Templars could usually expect to be executed if captured. For example, after the second major battle in 1187 at Hatton, after many Templars died in battle, 230 wounded Templar knights who were captured were beheaded by Saladin. Gerard de Ridefort was wounded in that battle and captured, but was considered too valuable to kill and he remained a prisoner, basically a ransomed hostage until 1188, during which time the order was commanded by Brother Thierry from Tyre. Ridefort was offered release by Saladin if he could convince a Templar fortress to surrender peacefully and no harm would come to the defenders. Ridefort succeeded and on his release went to Tortosa, where he took command of the Templars' defense of their castle, which held out after the fall of the town to Saladin's siege forces. In 1189, Ridefort again joined forces with Guy Le Seigneur, and after taking Edward II's money to fund his operation, led the Templars during the Siege of Acre, where he was again taken prisoner and beheaded by Saladin on 4 October 1189. The Templars' fierce reputation preceded them, and at the Battle of Laforbi in Gaza, in October 1244, an Ayyubid army defeated the Europeans and 300 Templar knights were killed, many being executed after having been wounded and captured. In the late 12th century, when the Muslim armies under Saladin recaptured Jerusalem, it forced the Knights Templar to relocate several times. The fall of Acre in 1291 marked the destruction of the last remaining Crusader refuge in the Holy Land proper, although they still had a presence in the Muslim world. Their successes established a model upon which other military orders would be created, such as the Knights Hospitaller, Knights of Malta, and the Teutonic Knights. The Knights Templar realized that they needed money, and they saw an opportunity, and established the most prosperous network of banks in Europe up to that time, which was really an international banking system. They began establishing lending houses, currency exchange centers, where they gained enormous financial and political influence. Their banking system was the first of its kind, which allowed religious pilgrims to deposit assets in a Templar bank in their home countries, where they received a script or a certificate of deposit drawn on gold or silver value, and they could present the letter or script to another bank anywhere in Europe as well as withdraw their money when they arrived in the Holy Land. They also gave massive loans to businesses, nobles, and even monarchs who needed hard currency, especially when they were raising armies for their never-ending wars against each other. The Templars were easily distinguishable by their style of dress, which featured a white habit emblazoned with a simple red cross, including never wearing pointed shoes or other unauthorized garments. Their official symbol was two knights riding a horse, indicating that no brother would leave another behind. As the Knights Templar grew in size and status, the Templars also had a large fleet of merchant ships and warships, and they effectively owned the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. Maritime commerce was a big business. Cyprus also served as a primary location for their bank and lending institution to European monarchs and nobles, but their growing wealth and political influence saw the Knights Templar facing criticism from many religious leaders, such as the kings of Europe. The Templars loaned massive amounts of money to European kings who needed to finance their wars and to businesses that wanted to expand, as long as all borrowers had solid collateral Given that they answered to no laws outside the Vatican, 
controlled the banking system and were the most powerful Christian military force, most of the Western rulers became wary of them, especially as they began to accumulate a huge network of lands and cash reserves. They accused the Templars of abusing their privileges and extorting the maximum profit from their financial dealings, as well as being accused of corruption and succumbing to gross pride and avarice. Some of the criticisms were that they lived too soft a life and wasted money which could be better spent on maintaining troops for holy war. They were also accused of wasting resources to compete with rival orders, especially the Hospitallers. There was, too, the old argument that monks and warriors were not a compatible combination. They were accused of not being interested in converting Muslims but simply eliminating them. But to be fair, most of these criticisms were unfounded and many European leaders who never served in the Holy Land were basically ignorant of the situations they faced. Basically, most of their opposition came from those who owed them a lot of money and those who were jealous of their power and status. By 1303, the Knights Templar lost its last foothold in the Muslim world and established their base of operations in Paris, where King Philip IV of France resolved to bring the order down, perhaps because the Templars had denied him additional loans. Philip had inherited the debts of his father and grandfather, which were massive due to their constant wars with England, and he wanted additional loans, but he was out of collateral. Then, in 1307, the Templars were accused of denying Christ as God, homosexual practices, indecent kissing, and the worship of idols, and desecrating and denying the crucifixion and the cross. Rumors were spread that the initiation ceremony into the Templars involved trampling, spitting, and urinating on a crucifix. Philip IV published these charges in the public forum, and the regular clergy joined in the condemnation as they were jealous of the order's rights, such as those of burial, a potentially lucrative sideline for any local church. On Friday, October 13, 1307, King Philip IV of France ordered the arrest of all the Templars in France possibly due to a variety of reasons, such as perceiving them as a military threat. He was supported by Pope Clement V, whom Philip had placed in his position through political maneuvering, so he had a powerful ally. The most rational reason for this attack was due to the fact that France being virtually bankrupt and Philip owing so much money wanted to confiscate their wealth and gain political power and prestige over the papacy. It is not known that Philip actually believed the rumors against the order. Under brutal torture, Philip managed to extract confessions from several Templars, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay. As a result, Pope Clement ordered the arrest of all Templars in Western Europe and seizure of their property. The Templars were unable to resist except in Aragon, where a number of knights held out in their castles until 1308. The very public trial of the Templars in Paris in 1310 saw 54 brother Templars burnt at the stake at one time, while others died in prison or under torture. Finally, after being forced to witness each and every death of his knights, in 1314, Jacques de Molay and the preceptor of Normandy, Geoffrey de Charny, were also burnt. The 1311 Council of Vienne finally set up the destruction of the order following the investigations conducted during the last three years into the Templars' business affairs throughout Europe, as well as the forced confessions. Pope Clement officially disbanded the order on April 3, 1312. During the trials, the Templars were not allowed supporting witnesses. There was no actual evidence for any of the accusations, such as records, statues of idols, nor even non-Templar witnesses to support the charges. Nothing was ever produced. Many of the knights later retracted their confessions, claiming duress under torture, but their fates were sealed. The majority of former Templar knights who escaped and not accused were pensioned off and banned from joining any other military order. Many of their lands were passed on to the Knights Hospitaller by order of the Pope on May 2, 1312. However, due to this church-sponsored fratricide, the other orders also fell under scrutiny but because the crowned heads of Europe were not indebted to them, including King Philip, and the fact that the Teutonic Knights, for example, had protection from their own powerful rulers, they remained unharmed. King Philip benefited the most from the destruction of the Templars. He was out of debt, took their lands in France, and he petitioned King Edward II of England to seize most of the Knights Templars' wealth in that country, which King Edward did. However, Edward would not execute the Templars in England, and many fled to Scotland and Ireland for their safety. 
Many rumors surfaced during the period of the purges and long afterward, such as that the Knights Templar may have secretly guarded the Shroud of Turin for hundreds of years after the Crusades ended, as well as protected the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant and parts of the cross from Christ's crucifixion and the legendary Spear of Destiny. Regardless of what you may or may not believe, the Knights Templar altered the social and political fabric of Europe forever. Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please click like, subscribe, and share. Send us comments and show ideas, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.